He's been there for 13 years. I can't believe it. Can you believe it, Steve? No. <laughs> and um, he's been teaching and coordinating the program in the graduate area for four years. He teaches a lot of different courses, both undergraduate and graduate. And he recently published a book, New Media and Public Relations, from which chapter 20 is taken. And uh, that's the chapter that he's going to be speaking about tonight. Um, he has been a featured speaker and a panelist at many conferences, not only here in New England, but across the country. He's very, very much in demand um, because he is not only an, an expert in social media and its uses, but he also works with the BU International Office to facilitate their program in Spain, which is an advanced communication summer study program. So he also has an appointment on the faculty over there in Spain. And he works with them on their master's degree in corporate communication. Right now, he has another book coming out. He's co-authoring Managing Corporate Communication, a cross-cultural approach, yes, which many of you may be interested in. And um, it, it includes many contributions from scholars, not only here in the United States, also, but from abroad. And then, in 2011, the Public Relations Society gave him an award, which is a very rare, very distinguished award, of being the Outstanding Educator of the Year, which we're very happy to <laughs> And then prior to that, the PRSA, um, that's Public Relations Society of America here in Boston, awarded him a Diane Davis Beacon Award for Lifetime Achievement, which again is another very prestigious award. Um, he is also the recipient of the LBJ Student Advisor of the Year, because he advises students just as we do here with you at LaSalle. And he received the BU Award for being the best advisor on campus. And um, he's also been a public relations consultant um, who's worked with corporations and nonprofit and government organizations in the area of media relations, crisis communication, community relations, and social media. And prior to coming to BU, where we worked together side by side. He was a public relations associate at a very prestigious firm here in Boston, Schneider and Associates. Joan Schneider is a, a graduate. She's an alum of BU College of Communication. And he is the advisor for the 13th year to the Boston University Edward L. Bernays chapter of the PRSSA, which is the Public Relations Student Association, which we hope to start up here at LaSalle. You can come out and tell us how you do it, because we'd love to have a student chapter. And so we're very, 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 very happy to have Steve with us tonight. Thank you, Steve. And um, Donna is going to share with you some information about an event that Steve has organized at BU, the College of Communication, that we are invited to, and the college will pay for 10 students to go and two faculty, and, and Steve brought the flyers. So if you want to take a minute and just explain to the students, and Steve, if you want to talk about how you put that together, it would be great. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Barrett. Um, Honor, privilege to be here, to be introduced by Professor Barrett, and to, uh, very scary for me to follow after Professor Lurbridge. Because when I grew up in the field of public relations, Professor Lurbridge was it. You know? yes. So uh, yeah. I'm He not, still is it. He still but is you're it. Gaining. I'm not happy to follow him. I wish I you're had gone gaining. first. So, you're gaining. Um, I'm actually going to, can we hand that out toward the end, or would you rather hand it out now? Oh, OK. All right. Donna had mentioned that. I'm oh, sorry. I thought you wanted to talk out. about it. Actually, uh, Professor Barrett gives me too much credit. I didn't really organize it. I was really just sort of the go-between. Um, representing Boston University College of Communication and two important professional organizations. One, uh, Professor Barrett mentioned, Public Relations Society of America, the largest association in the world of public relations professional, and another very similar organization, a lot of initials here, IABC, the International Association of Business Communicators. 
So those two groups in their Boston chapter collaborated and decided that they want to do a program on the future of media, the fast-changing, crazy, unpredictable world of media. Um, they asked if we might sponsor it at Boston University, which, we, of course, we were happy to do. And then um, they asked if I wanted to moderate the panel. And I said, I don't know enough to moderate the panel, especially because they had some incredibly impressive speakers who, were gonna, who are going to be part of that program. And I suggested that they ask our dean to moderate the panel, our dean, Tom Kiebler, uh, not only as dean of Boston University College of Communication, but previous to joining uh, BU, he was the managing executive editor of the Miami Herald on a Pulitzer Prize. He knows more about media than I will ever forget. So he's going to moderate the panel. And we have, as you'll see uh, on the flyer, a list of very distinguished journalists, media professionals, who are going to talk about where they believe the world of media is headed. And there's going to be a networking reception before, and then the panel presentation, and then a brief reception after. It's going to be at Boston University Photonic Center, which is kind of a nice building, good view of the city. Um, and you are all more than welcome to attend. Um, there will be mostly professionals there, and there will be some students from Boston University and other uh, schools as well. And the professionals will represent a mix of public relations, marketing, internal communication, digital communication, the whole sort of spectrum. It's going to be a lot of chance to ask questions of the panelists to try to better understand where we think the world of media is headed. And Thank it's, you. So that's, that's the story. Um, and the flyers, I guess, are coming around. If you have any questions about it, uh, again, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, but that was much too much credit for the program. It was really organized by these two organizations, and I was more like the person who booked the room. So. Thank you very much for alerting us of the event, and again, for being here, Professor. Um, so just to reiterate what Dr. Barrett said, um, the department is very happy to sponsor 20 students, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> 20? We just increased. We just found some more money. Uh, just now, just a minute. Um, so if anyone's interested, the panel is called Future of the Media, and it's a really interesting panel with very distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, so if anyone's interested, you can let me know, I'll write your name down, or you can reply to the email that you got uh, yesterday, uh, so we can register you. And um, the BU, as you probably know, is walking distance from the T, so I'll be taking the T from LaSalle, and anyone can join me uh, from the 20th. Thank you so and much. And I know the Photonic Center is, so I can show you that beautiful room up there. Yes, yes. And it's a good idea to take the tea. I can say this from first-hand experience because I thought, it's only nine miles mm -hmm. to LaSalle. I'm going to drive. And I am I was close to being late. That's why I'm a little bit sweaty. So <laughs> it took me, what, an hour and ten minutes to go nine miles. So the tea might be a better right Absolutely. So. Well, thanks a lot for being here. It's my honor. It's my pleasure. I, I don't know LaSalle well. I know Dr. Barrett, obviously. I got a little bit lost in this building, so I had a chance to wander around a little bit, and it feels very warm and friendly. Boston University, which I love and I'm very proud of, is not really warm and friendly. It's big and urban, and this school, to me, feels like it's really very welcoming, so it's nice to be here. Um, I would love it. One of the most basic axioms of mass communication is the importance of two-way communication. And I know you've been learning that over and over again in a few courses, but it's really important. And so in a minute, I'm going to ask you, sorry, if you would just share with me and with your classmates a little bit about you. Who are you? Maybe where you're from? And if there's a particular area of communication or a career interest that you have, if you have one, we're all trying to figure out that question. But if you have one, I'd love to know that. And if there's anything in particular that you would like to address in the next 45 minutes or I guess we have until 7.30. With the case study. With correct. the case study. If there's anything in particular that you would like to address, I would love to know that. And if it's something that I'm that I don't know much about, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll admit it. All right? So if we could go around, but first a quick story as to why two-way communication is so important. This morning when I woke up and I was getting dressed, I put this suit coat on. And my wife said to me, oh, you're wearing that coat. <laughs> Five words, two people, we've been married for over 30 years, we know each other really well. And yet, think about it, two people really familiar with each other, five words, the meaning of those five words could be very different depending on context, right? Because what if she said, oh, you're wearing that shirt? I mean, that jacket, excuse me. Well, obviously she would be saying, 
that doesn't look very good. On the other hand, she might have said, oh, you're wearing that jacket. Maybe it's the one I wore when we got engaged or something, because I keep my clothes for a long time. So five words, two people know each other really well, completely, I don't know whether to be insulted or flattered, right? So what can I do? What can we as communicators do to try to create shared meaning, which is, after all, what we all get paid to do what we study how to do. How do we create shared meaning? It's a really hard thing to do, even though when you tell your friends or your parents, well, what are you studying? I'm studying communication. Their reaction is always the same. You can see their face, right? Oh, well, haven't you been doing that your whole life? I mean, what is there to do, right? But five, five words, two people, opposite meanings. Now work for IBM, 500,000 employees, more than three million customers. Government, community, regulators, newspapers, magazines, huh? complicated world. So how did I clarify whether my wife was insulting me or whether she was praising me? I practiced two-way communication. And I said, very maturely, what do you mean? <laughs> she goes, no, 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 I like that jacket. I was like, oh, phew, thank you. So we're going to practice two-way communication because although I can't really totally adjust what I might say. Maybe I can adjust a little bit so that there's a little bit more shared meaning that we might have otherwise. In some ways, I don't care about the textbook definitions because every textbook has a different definition. I like to talk about public relations as boundary spanning. Okay, So here's, here's what I'm going to try to draw. Um, my way of explaining public relations is that every, every example of public relations starts with an organization, right? So. We, public relations professionals, communicators, have one foot inside this organization, Children's Hospital, Nike, IBM, Cell College, doesn't matter what it is, right? We've got one foot inside this organization. And then we've got another foot inside a group of people that there's different words for these groups. Sometimes we call them publics, right? That's probably familiar. Some people call them stakeholders. Doesn't matter. What does it mean? This is a group of people who have similar interests and upon whom we depend for success. And every organization has lots of publics, lots of stakeholders. And as I said previously, unfortunately, we can't demand that they see the world the way we want them and need them to see it. We've got to earn that kind of shared meaning, right? So we've got one foot inside the organization and one foot inside this public. And here's our goal. Use two-way communication between the organization and the public. Notice the arrow goes both ways. So we get paid to listen. But most of us would rather talk, particularly me, than listen. But smart boundary spanners listen. And here's what they do. They get paid to create alignment. We talked about alignment, right? How can we create alignment? There's two ways. We usually think there's one. The normal answer to that question, and I'm rushing, and I apologize because I would much rather ask you, but I'm not going to just because we have time constraints. The normal way is I know what we're going to do. We're going to use communication to get this group of people to see the world the way we need and want them to see it. So we're going to persuade them to align their view of the world with our desired view of the world. That's persuasion. We get paid to do that. That's a good thing. But there's a second way. And it's the one that doesn't get as much attention. And it's why public relations and communication have enormous potential to make the world a better place. And that is, we also use this information to get the organization, whoops, I'm going to erase this for now. We use that same information and those same communication skills to get the organization to change, to accommodate the needs and perceptions and wants and desires and goals of the stakeholder group. It's a two-way street, right? Traditionally, it's a one-way street. Persuade those employees to work harder even though we're cutting their pay or, or whatever, right? You get the, so you know, you're like, oh boy, this is going to be hard, right? Well, it is hard because you're trying to use words to convince people that something that's not in their best interest is in their best interest, right? That's a tough job. And sometimes it's the job that we do. But what about working for an organization that says, I really don't see this as a one-way street. I think we need to change to accommodate them as much as we use your skill to have them accommodate us. So there's lots of conversations that happen between communication professionals and senior executives where we bring the news back to the executives so we can say, hey, boss, you're not going to want to hear this. 
No amount of advertising or websites or PR or publicity, no amount is going to get them to see the world the way you want them to. We are out of alignment with them. Let's focus on actions first and then words second, right? Because every one of us in this room from the moment, well, I don't know about the moment we were born, from when we were two years old, let's say, we are geniuses. We are like supercomputers at parsing, meaning separating, the gap between what people say and what they really mean. So why do companies think that it's any different, right? When I say to my kids, when my kids were little, I would say to them, okay, Brendan, it's time to go to bed, right? And he knew that's the first one. <laughs> and he was like four years old, okay, that's the first one. And he's playing with his toys and all that. Brendan, it's time to go to bed. Second one, okay, I can it. And then finally, Brendan, get to bed, Ooh, goes to bed, because he knew, right? There was a gap between what I said and what I really meant, and that's an important thing to be able to do. Otherwise, think about how we would be misled by people who have an ulterior motive. They want to get me to do something, and in order to get me to do it, they're going to say whatever it takes to get me to believe them, whether or not they mean it or not. So we're all good at that. So why is it that executives think that when they hire somebody to do communications for them, that somehow that group of people who've been geniuses at parsing actions and words suddenly lose the ability? And all of a sudden, because there's a billboard, that they walk by and say, oh, that's the truth. No. This is hard, right? Actions and words need to be aligned. Second quick point, there are lots of stakeholder groups that we have to pay attention to, that the, that the organization depends on. I'm going to pick six. It's fairly arbitrary. You could say that there's 30. Here's my six. Uh, I'm going to start with this group, since I mentioned them already. Employees. This intersection of the organization and that group of people known as employees is a subset of communications and public relations. This is employee communication, or it's got all kinds of different words, internal communication, or human resources communication, or employee engagement, doesn't matter. It's boundary spanning. You've got one foot within the employees of Quigley Corporation, and one foot within Quigley Corporation, and your job, Mr. Communicator, is to create alignment. Two ways to do it. Get us to move to them, get them to move to us. Build complementarity. Build symbiotic relationships, okay? Now let's go right around. I'm going to do this really fast. This is the one that we're famous for, right? Media. We're in the field of public relations, spend most of our time dealing with media, and we're trying to, one foot in, one foot there, trying to get the media to see the world we need them to see it. And we can keep going, right? What about this group? Customers. Wow, that's rather important, right? I'm going to call this, for the sake of tonight's conversation, this intersection right here, I'm going to call that, quote, marketing PR. It's kind of a funny term, right? But most people, when you say, I'm in public relations, they assume, and it's not a bad assumption, that this is what PR people do. They sell products and services to customers. Well, it is a huge part of what we do, but it's not all we do. We do media relations, that's this one. We do employee relations, that's that one. We do, here's a big one, the parliament of Saudi Arabia. We do government relations because our company cannot succeed without some shared meaning and cooperation between the enterprise and the governments that can regulate us. Almost done. We've got a group that we call community. So, LaSalle College, are we in Newton or Brooklyn? Newton, right? Newton, yes. Newton. Okay. LaSalle, if LaSalle decides that they want to build a new classroom building, they can't do it without the city of Newton saying, okay, you have our approval to do that, right? I know Dr. Barrett knows a lot about government relations and community relations. It's not the subset of PR that most people think of. Most people think of this. It's a really important area. Think about how important it is, for example, for Walmart to start to figure out how to improve their government relations, their community relations. If Walmart wants to build a giant store in Newton, that's a tough task. There are a lot of people in Newton, both government people and community people, that are going to say, no, thank you very much, we don't, we're not interested. How do you earn alignment, right? And lastly, if it's a publicly traded company, we have a, a whole other exotic subset, investor relations. Now, this is only going to be true of a company that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange, right? But there are a lot of public relations people who get paid to have one foot inside a publicly traded company 
and one foot I'm going to use vernacular in Wall Street. And their job is to use two-way communication to create more alignment between the company and the people who invest in it, or the potential investors. So, summary now. Just from this messy, quick, breathless drawing, we've identified at least six subsets of public relations or communication. We've got media relations, employee communication, investor relations, community relations, government relations, and what I'm going to call marketing PR. First thought, which one of these is best for you? Right? Which one are you most interested in? Maybe none of them. Okay, then maybe we need a different model. But if you're sitting there saying, you know what, I really like the investor side. Like, I love finance. We've got some accounting majors. There's a need for people who understand finance and accounting who can communicate complex financial information to audiences of people in order to protect that company's stock price. Two ways to do it. One is get them to see the world the way we need them to. The other is for us to adjust what we do to be greater aligned with them. When somebody on an elevator asks you what is public relations, you're not going to have time for this, right? So you're just going to have to come up with a quick way of saying it. But since I have more time, I took a long version. Yes, please. Yeah. We would say, like, uh, both parties should uh, take a movement. Yeah, ideally. Ideally, what we want to do is we want to show movement. Because our job in PR is ultimately to build trust, right? To build trust and to protect reputation. When's the last time you trusted someone who refused to even budge your way? It was all you adjust to me, right? So think of a girlfriend or a boyfriend, right? And every day, where do you want to go? I want to go to the Red Sox game. Well, you know, I don't really like the Red Sox. Well, that's where we're going, right? Like, show me a little movement here. Show me a little mutuality, right? It's all about you. Okay, at some point, that gets old. So is it all about you only? Or can you communicate two ways, listen and speak in a way that acknowledges and respects and rewards the goals of the groups that you depend on. Otherwise, it's just a lecture. And we get sick of lectures fast, right? I mean, so we trust people whose actions seem to be consistent with our interests, not just their own. Tricky stuff. Thanks for letting me do that little side thing. Um, I forget what I got. OK. We are, you know that old expression, may you live in interesting times? You are living in interesting times when it comes to communication. It is exhilarating and it's petrifying, right? Because the rules are in flux. Is that I, okay? I think I prefer with, with just one on. Is there a way to? All right. Ah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, how do I feel about what's happening in the field of public relations and communication? That's how I feel. I am exhilarated and I'm scared because it's easier when the rules stay standard and steady and consistent because all you have to do is master the rules, right? Our rules are changing. You, your generation, is forcing change on my generation and it's scary to us. And the change is not consistent, right? Some organizations are like that jet, and some are like that old-fashioned plane, right? So the changes that are happening in communication are not going to be the same. So I had a student once say to me after one of my classes, I teach a class called New Media and Public Relations, and she came up to me after class, and she said, you know, Chris, quickly, I have to tell you, I get such a headache after your class. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to. And she goes, no, I don't mean it like a bad headache. I just mean it like a headache. I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, I go to this class, and they say, here's what the rules are. right? And then I go to your class, and you say the opposite. That's what the rules are. And I'm like, which one is the right set of rules? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's confusing. It's changing. In some organizations, things haven't changed. And so the best way to prosper in that organization is to stick to the traditional rules. But in other organizations, it's been turned upside down. And in order to win, you got to get one of these big, fancy jets. For 100 years, the rules have been pretty consistent. And all of a sudden, in the last 20 years, it's been turned upside down. Right? Some ways for the better, some ways for, for worse. And we'll focus quite a bit on how the web, how the internet, has really, really driven a lot of those changes that now are creating some of the opportunity and confusion. And I see four C's that I hope 
I can touch on in a short amount of time. Um, control. Your generation is taking control out of the hands of big organizations, media, government, religion, corporations. You are taking it out of their hands, and you're taking control yourself. Every one of you, I suspect, has a smartphone. In that phone, you have the answers that you need. You don't depend on media to give you the answers, right? You can get them when you want them. Well, that's scary, right? It's scary. It's a whole lot easier when we could just have one answer. And the metaphor I like to use is back to an airplane now. Traditional mass communication is like an airplane where a bunch of smart people got together and created a brochure, wrote something really smart and fancy and clever, and printed a million of them. Costs a lot of money. Rented a plane. Now, cost an extra lot of money. Flew around to try to find their target audience. You with me? Dropped a million brochures on the target. Interesting that it's a military metaphor, isn't it? Knowing that most of the people upon whom these things were landing didn't want them and wouldn't pick them up and look at them. But some would. Maybe it would be 1%. In a, ma in a traditional mass mailing campaign, 1% response rate is considered really good. 1%. So we drop a million, I can't do the math in my head, and we know that only 1% of them on a good day are going to pick up the flight, right? Because you guys are saying, I don't need to wait for that plane with the flight. I've, I've got it right here in my phone. If I want to get something, I go and I get the answer. Why would I wait? I'm not going to wait for your brochure to land on my shoulder that says Steve Quigley's restaurant is the best restaurant in Boston. If I want to know what the best restaurant in Boston, I'm going to go to Facebook or Yelp or Twitter or wherever I go, right? Boy, control is huge. Content. Today, marketing is about content marketing. Not just about how great my product is, but how my product can solve your problem. How my product can make your life better, more interesting, more fun, more whatever, right? So we're switching. The product is in the center. The product is on the periphery. Who's in the center? The customer's in the center. And it's their life that we have to adjust our communication to, not the other way around. So those folks who are successful in communication today are focusing on creating content that's customized, another C word, to meet the needs of the lives of the people that they're trying to reach, not just to sell stuff. Because the premise is that if we get good at creating content, and in order to be good, you've got to do boundary span. How can I create content for you unless I really know what you think and need and want and feel? But if I can, if I can know what you think and need and want and feel, I can become the source of information for you that makes your life better, and then indirectly I build trust and brand. Content marketing is a huge phenomenon in the world of corporate communication and public relations. Context, this is really tricky. With the plane up there, 50,000 feet up in the air. There's no context. You just come up with your strategy, you come up with a campaign, you create your brochures, you drop them on the target, no context. Communication today is contextual. It is responsive to what's happening now for this group of people. Today, what are they tweeting about? Is it the Super Bowl? Well, if it's the Super Bowl, is there a way for us to get our message into the context of the Super Bowl? Is it the weather? Is it the fact that the Red Sox started playing again? How can I find a way to make my information fit the context of the people that I'm trying to connect with? Again, it's a reversal. We're not up on a plane. We're on the street. We're on the sidewalk. And we're looking at people and understanding them and saying, here's how our information can be customized to fit the context that we think what's important to you right now. And lastly, community, this is the biggest one, I think. I believe that for some organizations, the notion of audience is shifting to the notion of community. Now that's a big deal. What does that mean? An audience is someone you send information to. You talk at an audience, right? A community is a group you are part of. And you discuss with community. You understand community. You know what's valuable to them. And you try to find value for the community because you're part of it. So there's a new job title that many of you have seen that I'm really excited about. And it's called community manager. Right? So big brands are hiring people to be community managers. What does that mean? Well, it could be silly. It could be a company that produces dog food. 
and, and they're coming up with a new line of dog food that's really expensive, and it's really only for people who are crazy about their dogs, and money is no object, right? So the new, a new approach to marketing to that group of people is to have someone be part of that group, to connect with them on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and face-to-face -face and know what they think and want and need and feel and look for opportunities to help satisfy their needs as a community, not as an audience. Watch for that title community manager. General Mills, the big mighty General Mills, the marketing powerhouse that is General Mills here in the US, big food corporation, they just took about a million dollars out of their agency budget, the external agency PR, advertising, marketing, digital, and they took it in-house and they hired 10 community managers, each assigned to a specific brand, and said, be in that community and help us be a better company. Not just messaging, but who we are, what we do, what's important to them. How big a box would they like? Like, what's a price that would work for them? You get the idea? This isn't just words. This is understanding a community, trying to build that. So, four C's. This is a little bit irreverent, so I apologize in advance, but some folks who study what happened last century say, last century was the century of the Holy Trinity, meaning three things that came together all at the same time that made a lot of people powerful and rich. One of those three things. Mass production, mass media, mass communication. So we've got standardized products, lots of them, that we use powerful, centralized media outlets send information of standardized messages to get people to buy whatever it is, right? That's a powerful combination. Think about the brands, the companies, the organizations that have prospered from that three-way intersection. There are plenty of them, and they're still prospering, right? Nike, Coca-Cola, just to mention a few, right? Those two brands, they're masters of this. It's not going to go away. But now there are new ways, right? Now, you don't have to be able to afford a factory or enough money to buy ads during the Super Bowl and hire a fancy schmancy communications company. There are new ways to connect with people that don't require the wealth and power and resources that these three strategies require. So now there are threats to companies that have built their success around these three things. And the threat is the phones that are in your pocket. Right? Because you can see a message that fits the Holy Trinity, and then you go to Facebook and say, hey, should I buy Nike or should I buy uh, Adidas? I usually say Adidas, but I knew this was a hip group, so I tried to change it. Adidas, I use Adidas, whatever, niche, niche, which one? I say niche because I can't bring myself to say niche. So you have ways of checking to see if this powerful trinity is consistent with what you need. And who do you turn to? This is the big change. You turn to people like me. You turn to your friends on Facebook. You turn to people who actually ate at the restaurant and you find what they think on Yelp, right? You go to Twitter because you've got a whole bunch of people you follow who are runners on Twitter. And so you go to Twitter and you say, hey, everybody, I can't decide between Adidas and Nike. What do you say? And you get people who are like you, who love running, who maybe are college students who say, oh, do this. That scares the heck out of this system, right? Not that the system doesn't work, it still works, but now there are challenges to that system that are important for us as communicators. So here we are. This is the basic model of mass communication. This is what all of us have learned to master, and you do too. You need to learn this, right? Because we've got an organization, and we want to reach lots of people with information that helps our organization be successful. Reach lots of people, mass media. How else are we going to reach 10 million people? Everybody okay? This is the standard model of what we do mass communication. This part, traditionally, there's two ways two ways to get mass media to distribute our message. One is advertising, we buy the message. Great, good stuff. Two, public relations, we earn publicity so that. Cosmopolitan Magazine writes about our new fashion design. Not as, not as coming from Steve Quigley's fashion company, God forbid, but coming from Cosmopolitan's Magazine. Photos of the new fashion line that they've decided are important to us, right? Advertising and PR. 
We work side by side in very different ways. They pay, we earn. Life is good, nice and simple, right? So let's look at what PR people need to do. To be good at what we do traditionally, we've got to know how the gate works. Because the gate is slammed shut. You want it, your, your company says to you, I want, we're coming up with a new uh, smartphone, and I want you to get a story on our smartphone in Forbes magazine. Okay, great. So you develop a plan, you knock on the door of the technology editor at Forbes magazine, and you say, Mr. Editor, I've got a great story for you about a new cell phone. He goes, okay, all right, Harry, quick, quick, I'm, I'm busy, I'm busy. What do you got? What do you got? Here's the news release. Okay, like, yeah, it seems like the same old phone. Everybody has door slammed, gates slammed shut. Smart publicists figure out ways to get the gate to open, and you can't write out a check. That's what our friends in advertising do. You've got to earn their interest, and you earn it by saying, I've got something that I want to offer you that will be valuable to your subscribers, your listeners, your viewers, your So we work side by side in traditional mass communication to do that. That's not going to go away. If you're good at that, either of these. If you're good at earning or creating ads that you pay for that have the effect on the public, you are going to have a great career. It's really good stuff. Powerful. We sometimes, you guys, I'm sure, did Otto talk about uh, Edward Bernays or? Yes, he mentioned. Edward Bernays, the father, the godfather, the grandfather of public relations, was brilliant at saying not everybody's opinions created equal. If you want to influence this group of people, get to the people who influence them, right? So Bernays was smart, right? And he wanted to, he, this is kind of silly, but he wanted to sell more bacon. It's a little bit weird. But he went to doctors and he said, this is 100 years ago, and he said, hey, what do you think would make a good, healthy breakfast for an American young person? Well, bacon, eggs, and orange juice. OK. Doctors say bacon, eggs, and orange juice is a really good breakfast. Now today, we look at that and go, that's ridiculous. 100 years ago, it wasn't ridiculous. right? So you're going to get paid a lot of money when, you, when you're trying to use communication to shape people's opinions and attitudes and behaviors if you can figure out who are the people who influence them. And how do we get to them as part of our strategy, right? So back in the day, uh, President Reagan's uh, wife, Nancy, famously came up with an anti-drug campaign that had the ad slogan, just say no, right? What happens when you say, just say no, to a 14-year-old? When you're an old person, you say, just say no. They say yes, right? They do the opposite of what you told them to do, right? So that campaign has been criticized by smart people who said, you know, they should have been looking at the opinion leaders. Who do 14-year-old boys look at to influence what they think is good and smart and cool and, and best? They don't look at, in this case, Nancy Reagan. They don't look at their parents doing this and that. They look at other people. So how do you get them to shape behavior? So that's classic, traditional public relations. And look what happened. At Boston University faculty get paid by the syllable. So this is the biggest word I can find. It's sort of like Scrabble. Disintermediation. That's a five-syllable word. I get a bonus for however many times I say that. I'm kidding. This is an intermediary, a mass medium. They, today, are being dissed, to use teenage vocabulary. They're being dissed because now you and I have ways of getting what we want that don't require us to go through mass media. Everybody all right? This is the revolution, right? Doesn't mean that the traditional stuff goes away. It's still with us. It always will be. But now there's another game in town. And last point, look at the arrows. The arrows point two ways. We can get information out to audiences directly without having to go through mass media. But now the real secret sauce, we can get information from audiences, tapping into smartphones and, and yeah, et cetera. Right? Disintermediation, big word, is changing the world. Right? Look what it did. You, you guys probably don't know Block, Blockbuster is, was a very popular video rental company in the US. So when you 20 years ago, 20, 10, 15, 12, 12 years ago, if you wanted a video, you got in your car, you drove to the video store, which is called Blockbuster, you walked in, there were shelves full of videos, and you picked out the one that you wanted to rent and you paid the money. Today, just go to Netflix, right? So Blockbuster's out of business, basically, because we now have a way of going directly to get what we want. That is huge. Because you can't put that genie back in the bottle, right? You can't take a generation of people, your generation, who are used to getting what they want when they want it, 
and suddenly say, no, you can't have that. Put your phone away. You'll deci I'll decide which video you should watch. No. This is a big deal. <clears throat> push pull. Traditional communication has been push, right? It means we push messages to people that we think will work, we hope they'll work, we target the right group, and we push it at them. Very often they have no interest in it. Sometimes they do. The market is shifting toward pull. Pull is the yellow pages, if you're not from the US, your yellow pages is phone book. So that if, you're, if your sink was clogged at 2 in the morning, you didn't know what to do. You went to the phone book and looked up plumber, and you called somebody, can you fix my sink? And they came and fixed it. That's pull. That's when somebody had a problem, had a need, and they went and satisfied it on their own terms. They didn't say, the sink is clogged. Oh, shame. Let's sit back and see if there's going to be an advertisement on television for plumbers. I hope so. Who would do that? That was back in the old days when you had to lug around a big yellow phone book. Today you've got it in your pocket, right? Everybody's got all the information in the history of the world in your fingertips. So does it make sense to still launch campaigns that are push-based when we really should be doing a mix of push and pull? So here's the new question. How do we get the information that we want to get to people in places that's convenient for them so that when they want it, they get it and they find us. That's the new challenge. Search engines, right? Because look what the world has done. We still have traditional, but now people are getting what they want on their own terms. They go to Google to get what they want. Why don't they wait for an advertisement when they can just do this and all of a sudden I've got the answer. So here's the question. How do we make sure that when people go looking for our brand that they find us? Good news, if you're into traditional public relations particularly, and you do a really good job on publicity, publicity feeds Google. Everybody okay on that idea? Because when Google prints out for us as fast as it does, the list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 search results, right? Google does it based on a whole bunch of complicated stuff. One important variable is my words, not theirs. Do these guys have credible publicity? Are, is anybody out there in the world who's influential saying good things about them? Does the New York Times have a link on its website that points back to Quigley Corporation? I'm making that up, right? Because if the New York Times has a link that points to Quigley Corporation, they must be an important corporation when it comes to this word, whatever the search word is. So put them first. I just read something on Facebook today that said the best place to hide a dead body is the second page of Google. <laughs> Think about that. So our job is to do this stuff and also to do this stuff, right? To feed Google so that when the people we care about go looking for the stuff that we care about, they find us on the first page. That's search engine optimization, right? Or search engine marketing. Good news for PR people. Public relations feeds search. So not only do we get the benefit of the article that ran in the New York Times that talked about how amazing our new restaurant is, but if there's a link on that website, the New York Times website that goes back to our restaurant, Google says, wow, that's important. We get two bites from the same effort. There's a guy who makes a lot of money. He's written a book called The New Rules of Marketing and PR. His name is David Meerman Scott, and he speaks all over the world, right? And he stands up, and I've seen him do it a bunch of times, he stands in front of a crowd of people and he says, at the very beginning, before he starts his speech, oh, that's this. He says, I'm so sorry, I meant to bring business cards with me so I could hand them out to every one of you because I really hope that some of you will call me if you need a consultant. And then he hits this button, and of course the Google says, he goes, oh, no, there's my business card. Pretty clever. He then says, whatever you want to know about me, is there. His name is David Scott. That's a very average American name. He doesn't use David Scott. If you look at his book, he's David Meerman Scott. Because when you search for David Scott, you get 62 million results. And we search for David Meerman Scott. Guess who's first? He is. So he's David Meerman Scott. And he counts on Google to help market his business. And then, as if it wasn't complicated enough, this Harvard dropout comes along, right? And now he turns the world upside down yet again. Right? First Google turned the world upside down. Then that we were starting to figure that out. And then Zuckerberg comes along and creates Facebook. And now look how messy my illustration is. 
messy but powerful, I think. Because here's, uh, I think I'm going to stop. This system, if you want to see it as a system, this system is like one closed system because each piece of it feeds the other pieces. What do I mean? Journalists turn to Twitter to find story ideas. Twitter feeds search, feeds Google. Publicity feeds both of them. Look at what you share on Facebook and Twitter, right? Look at the stuff that's on social media. Much of it is traditional media content that is now being repurposed and shared on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, all those Instagram and all those other platforms, right? So here's the final point. There's at least three professions here, at least. One, a really good one, traditional mass communication, whether it's advertising, marketing, it doesn't matter. It's this idea of how do we use mass media to reach audiences in a way that's compelling. That's a really powerful thing, always has been. Today it's more powerful because it's being influenced and re, what's the word I want? Circulated. Re, thank you, recirculated by social and by search, right? So one, traditional effort is now more powerful. Two, be a search engine marketer. Help your organization produce content that's on the web that has the keywords that matter to your brand and to your audience. And when that audience goes looking for that thing, they're going to find you. And lastly, how do we get people to tell their friends about us through social, right? How do we get them to repost that video that we created? Because we know from the earlier part of this conversation that people are not trusting authority as much as we used to. Who do we trust? People like me. What's the most powerful platform ever built to get people like me to tell me stuff? Facebook, right? 1.23 billion of us sharing stuff with people who are sort of like us because they're kind of our friends, maybe, right? And now those people who are reposting stuff are marketing our brand, are building our reputation. Because they want to build our reputation? No, because it satisfies a need that they have. We use the term in Boston uh, that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. It certainly makes sense in Salem. If something is wicked, it means really good. Right? <laughs> so this is wicked exciting and wicked confusing. right? But if you can play all three or pick one of the three and make yourself like really good at that piece of it, you're really bad. Wicked valuable. <laughs> I had a few more, but we don't have time, so I think I'm going to stop. Yes? Unless there's really something you... Uh, no, I've got, I could go for weeks. <laughs> no, so. This was wonderful. This Good. was wonderful. I would, I would love to hear you go for weeks. Uh, ah, yeah, no, you wouldn't. <laughs>